Uh, welcome back. Uh, we have uh, started talking about quantum statistical mechanics and in that context we have introduced density matrices. So, we will uh, talk a little more about density matrices, their properties and uh, do some example problems uh, at least one and then leave a few for the uh, for the tutorials or the assignments. And uh, then we will talk about indistinguishability of particles and uh, really the exchange statistics that is associated with it. It is a very interesting uh, discussion and um, uh, should be you know understood with care and attention because this uh, really tells you that why in classical mechanics um, particles are indistinguishable and uh, in quantum mechanics uh, if you correctly you know uh, take into account their properties they should actually be indistinguishable and that is what quantum mechanics does. So, quantum mechanics is a more correct uh, formalism or a theory uh, and uh, classical mechanics only comes as a limiting case. Okay. Then we will uh, talk about uh, the classical particles Maxwell Boltzmann uh, obeying Maxwell Boltzmann statistics uh, bosons and fermions uh, from a rudimentary uh, point of view, but we will go uh, deeper into, uh, into the details and so on um, as we come to those statistics that is Bose Einstein and Fermi Dirac statistics. And then uh, we will just talk a little about quantum statistics and uh, maybe the canonical partition function etcetera. So, let us uh, go ahead with density matrices and the density matrices as we have said uh, is that. So, we were talking about density matrices and uh, the way we have defined it is this uh, rho m n um, maybe it is a function of t uh, because we have written down the equation of motion and this is k equal to 1 to n. Uh, a m k uh, well uh, we were not writing it with a bracket. So, we will just leave it like that and then a n uh, k star and a t and uh, this was a definition of density matrix uh, which is uh, as you can see that m and n uh, they denote the indices. So, it is uh, like the row and the column and so it is a matrix and uh, if we remind you that uh, we have written down similar equation. Uh, for the phase space density which was just a value was not a matrix in classical mechanics. So, uh, the phase space density again written with rho. Uh, so, phase space density in uh, classical mechanics or classical statistics uh, was written with this equation the equation of motion of that is uh, you know a d rho d t is equal to uh, del rho del t well this is rho del rho del t plus uh, 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 rho and h which is is called as a Poisson's bracket and uh, and uh, here for the density matrix we write a very similar equation in quantum statistics uh, as the d rho d t again uh, which is equal to a d rho d t and a plus a commutator bracket of h and rho and this is really the commutator bracket. So, what was a Poisson's bracket in classical statistics? is replaced by a commutator bracket in quantum statistics and as we said that um, so rho was just a number. So, rho is a function of uh, q, p and t uh, whereas here rho is actually a matrix which uh, can be written in terms of these uh, coefficients uh, a m k and a n k and uh, as it uh, turns out that it takes into account both this averages one is a quantum mechanical average and uh, the classical uh, I mean the uh, statistical average that is ensemble average as well. And uh, what we have done is that we have written down that uh, if you have any operator this is just a, a recapitulation. Uh, so, if you have any operator you can calculate the expectation value of the operator using the density matrix. So, what you do is that if you uh, you can take a trace of rho 
and uh, you have to divide it by trace of rho and uh, if trace of rho is normalized that is trace of rho equal to 1 then of course, the denominator does not come, uh, but this is how uh, the density matrix enters into the discussion. So, this is like the uh, quantum and the ensemble average of any operator. Okay. So, uh, we can also write the density matrix in a slightly different uh, uh, way. Uh, let me also write down this that what happens to the diagonal elements and the diagonal elements is nothing but this is equal to 1 over n and uh, this is uh, a n k uh, square and so on. So, this k equal to 1 to uh, n and uh, so this is the diagonal element and uh, let us uh, list out a few properties of this. of the density matrices. Okay. And uh, the properties are that, uh, so one can actually write uh, the density matrix as uh, an outer product of all those uh, psi k's that we have uh, you know talked about. Uh, so, let me write it without an index so that the summation is understood. So, this is the outer product and uh, some of the properties are let us say uh, it is a projector matrix or it is called as a the, the square of it, it is equal to the matrix itself um, and this is called as a projector property or it is called as an idempotent uh, matrix. Okay. And uh, second is that uh, the dagger uh, is equal to rho and uh, from your elementary quantum mechanics this is called as a hermeticity. So, that uh, rho is a Hermitian matrix. Okay. Um, 3 uh, the trace of rho uh, is equal to 1 and this is called as a normalization which we have just seen that uh, this appears at the denominator of uh, the expectation value and this is equal to uh, this is equal to 1. And uh, the last one which is uh, you know the rho is uh, greater than uh, equal to 0. So, rho is a positive definite matrix. Okay. Okay. So, these are some of the properties. Let us now uh, define with the aid of this density matrices uh, which are called as the pure and mixed states. Then uh, these are heavily used terminologies in uh, quantum optics and in other fields. Uh, so, uh, let us begin with the pure states. So, what are the pure states? if you take an ensemble of uh, objects or there are members of the ensemble in a given state say given as uh, some psi, uh, then uh, if the members of the ensemble are all in this state, uh, then it is called as a pure state. So, all members of the ensemble in state psi. Okay. And uh, this is called as a pure state. So, what happens is that uh, uh, in this uh, state the trace of uh, rho which is same as trace of rho square should be equal to 1. And of course, uh, we can define a mixed state where there are uh, you know n i uh, number of systems uh, that is members of the ensemble they are in state psi i. Okay. So, n 1 in psi 1, n 2 in psi 2. So, that is not a, a state where all the members of the ensemble they belong to the same state, uh, same quantum state psi. So, here uh, they belong to different uh, quantum states like n 1 in psi 1 and n 2 in psi 2 and so, so on and so forth. So, what one can do is that one can define a probability 
P i that is equal to say n i over n which is uh, the fractional number of uh, ensembles in, in a state psi i divided by the total number of ensembles. And um, uh, this is pertaining to the condition that your total P i is equal to 1 if you sum over all i. So, this rho uh, mix, so this is rho pure and rho mix would uh, simply be equal to a weighted average. So, this is uh, rho i uh, pure, uh, okay. so uh, let me write uh, uh, this pure to be here just in case, uh, so pure and it is it's also pure. So, this is uh, that pure states. So, you multiply uh, the uh, density matrices of the pure state and multiply it by the probability and this gives you the, uh, this called as a, a weighted sum or it is also called as the convex uh, sum and so on so forth. Okay? This has uh, some name. This expectation value of any operator, let us call it as O. So, O is uh, nothing but trace of in this, in such a state it is rho O it is not max, it is mix. I mean what I mean is mixed states. So, let me write it as full mixed. So, rho mixed uh, and O. Okay? So, this is the expectation value of the definition in the mixed state. Okay? All right. So, um, let us uh, uh, try to you know uh, understand it from uh, this perspective that uh, if you have these mixed state, uh, they would be incoherent superposition of uh, states. So, uh, we can write down the uh, elements of this mixed density matrix. So, this is equal to mixed. Uh, I am writing it sometimes on top and sometimes below, but please do follow a same. Uh, so, let us write it mixed here. So, this is P into trace of P into rho mixed. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is rho mixed into O, not P. Okay. So, that is the expectation value of the operator. All right. So, this is uh, that and then uh, we can write down the matrix elements as uh, in our earlier notation it is like k equal to again summing over the ensembles and we have a m k a n k star and this is equal to 1 over n and k equal to 1 to uh, n and then we have uh, say for example, uh, a square uh, and um, exponential i theta m k minus theta n k. So, what we have written as the a m uh, k is written as a into uh, exponential i theta m k and there is a phase factor and this tells you that uh, this is an incoherent superposition of uh, these uh, all these uh, phases. So, uh, all these basis states and uh, this is uh, finally, this you know can be written as some rho m n in the mixed state is equal to some uh, sub constant which is uh, this 1 over n and some a mod square and then it is uh, really the, uh, the we can just simply write it as a uh, constant c and write it as the expectation value of these states. And uh, if this uh, it is an incoherent superposition then theta m k minus theta n k will uh, exist that there is no definite phase relationship between these members of the ensemble and that is why it is a mixed state. Okay? So, uh, quickly if you uh, go through what will be the form of the density matrix at different ensembles. So, we can write this as We will start with the micro canonical ensemble 
and that is easy to see that the micro canonical the rho m n uh, should be equal to some rho n delta m n which means that it is a diagonal matrix that is uh, there is no overlap between the ensembles. Okay? So, it has no off diagonal elements. So, it is only the diagonal ones that are there and what is rho n? Rho n is nothing but 1 by the number of microstates because uh, when it gets summed over uh, all n that should give us uh, 1 and then um, you know uh, so the entropy can be obtained as k log omega okay? and omega is the number of uh, microstates or number of accessible states. Uh, going to the canonical, um, it is easy to see what it would be in the canonical. In the canonical distribution, one has uh, this thing as um, again it is diagonal. Uh, so, rho m n equal to rho n into delta m n and it is only that uh, the definition of rho n is given by the uh, Boltzmann factor which is c into exponential minus beta e n and e n denotes the uh, energy states or en the modes of the system where n equal to 0, 1, 2. It may actually skip 0 in some situation, but uh, in general it is there. So, it is exponential minus beta E n divided by sum over n exponential beta E n. So, this is nothing but equal to exponential minus beta E n by z. So, if you are asked a question that calculate the, um, the canonical uh, uh, this uh, density matrix in the canonical um, ensemble. So, it is simply the uh, this exponential minus beta E n by z uh, which we have seen which is nothing but the uh, the probability that uh, our state uh, occupies uh, an energy state E n um, at random among all the available energy states and um, it is only allowed to exchange uh, energy with uh, you know the uh, surrounding or with other members of the ensemble and come to an equilibrium temperature T which is given by 1 over uh, or which is beta equal to 1 over K T. Okay? So, uh, again uh, you have this uh, row to be row can be written in terms of the basis states as uh, like uh, uh, phi n and rho and uh, phi n. So, that is the basically nothing but the outer product of this uh, basis states and uh, you can just simply see that. Uh, so, we are not writing it with the operator, but it is an operator we, we should know that. So, rho k m is sum over n I use the uh, completeness of states. So, it is a phi k phi n uh, rho n. Um, so, this is actually rho n and um, a phi n and a phi m. Uh, so, there is a sum over n. So, this gives you delta k n because this uh, basis is orthonormal. Uh, so, this delta k n rho n and delta n m okay? and this is nothing but equal to uh, rho k delta k m. Okay? Now, this is uh, fine. So, this is the canonical distribution density matrix and uh, we can uh, calculate uh, you know. Uh, so, if you want to see the matrix form of that this only tells you what the uh, you know this uh, uh, term is. Uh, if you want to see what the form for the operator is, we can write it down as uh, rho equal to sum over n and we have a uh, phi uh, n and uh, we have an exponential minus beta h um, and uh, divided by z and uh, there is a phi n there. Okay? And this exponential minus beta h it actually can be expanded in terms of uh, like uh, say p equal to 0 to infinity and uh, you have a minus beta h uh, 
I am writing it a curly H because at times I need to denote also a magnetic field and this is uh, P divided by P factorial and um, so uh, this is nothing but equal to uh, exponential minus beta H divided by Z and uh, sum over N and a phi N phi N and uh, this outer product uh, for a um, proper orthonormal basis this is equal to 1. So, this gives you that this exponential minus beta H divided by Z and we have just not a 1, but it is like a identity matrix with all the diagonal entries to be equal to 1 and all the off diagonal entries to be equal to 0. So, uh, we can uh, like this is the form for the density matrix in the canonical ensemble and if you still want to write down uh, the expectation value of an operator which is nothing but trace of a rho and a O, O is written with just a hat just to make sure that it is any arbitrary operator okay? and this is nothing but equal to 1 by Z trace of um, O exponential minus beta H and um, this is uh, well there is nothing but trace of O exponential minus beta H and divided by trace of uh, exponential minus beta H. Okay. So, that is the form for this expectation value of the operator in the canonical ensemble and things are not too different in the grand canonical ensemble and we simply just write down this So, your density matrix is 1 over Z G, G stands for grand canonical and we have exponential minus beta H minus mu N. Now, we need this additional um, Lagrange's undetermined multiplier. So, H is uh, cannot be considered uh, alone, you have to consider H minus mu N and that is the matrix that you need to diagonalize in order to get the eigenvalues. So, uh, your Z G is nothing but this is equal to a trace of um, exponential minus uh, beta H minus mu N and uh, we know how to calculate this now and again uh, expectation value of any operators which now need to uh, integrate from or rather sum over N equal to 0 to infinity. We have introduced this fugacity factor and then this and then exponential minus beta H. Uh, this mu N is absorbed in the fugacity factor because Z F uh, which is called as a fugacity we have uh, introduced this before and this is nothing but equal to exponential beta mu. And um, this is the expression and of course, we also have a denominator which is N equal to 0 to infinity. Um, we have a Z F whole to the power N exponential minus beta H, H is the Hamiltonian of the system and that uh, you know would vary from case to case. Okay. So, um, this is the uh, important you know part of this application or rather this uh, formalism of density matrices and uh, just to remind you once more that uh, this plays the same role as a phase space density and it has this additional uh, handle of uh, taking these two averages such as the uh, statistical average and the quantum mechanical average together okay? and here uh, these both these averages are taken into account. So, let us do an example uh, and and this example is uh, say for example, you take a, a, a spin half particles in a magnetic field. Okay? So, okay, a magnetic field H. So, that the Hamiltonian of the system is actually minus mu b uh, sigma dot h, uh, mu b is the Bohr magneton or uh, the magnetic moment and uh, you can write it as mu 0 or mu b, uh, it is called as a Bohr magneton. 
uh, in previous occasions we might have written it with a mu 0. Okay. Now, uh, the question is that uh, obtain uh, the density matrix uh, uh, in a representation one in which in a representation in which um, sigma z is diagonal okay, which you are most familiar with. So, we start with the familiar uh, matrix and this sigma is nothing but the Pauli matrices. So, this is uh, sigma x, sigma y and sigma z and these are the Pauli matrices. Okay, and because we have talked about spin half particles, uh, assumably we are talking about electrons, but then we do not uh, want to still talk about electrons because uh, then there are many other things that need to follow, which will uh, definitely come, uh, you know, in the recent future. Uh, till then, we'll just talk about particles. And uh, to make matters more interesting, we also ask the question: What happens when sigma x is diagonal? Now, this is a, a very important uh, property of this uh, uh, matrices that uh, these density matrices that if you change the basis because we are talking about phi n and phi m kind of basis uh, that it is defined by. Now, uh, we have also defined this properties that is rho equal to rho square and uh, you know the trace of rho equal to 1 and trace of rho square equal to 1 and so on and so forth. Now, uh, what is the guarantee that if you go from one representation to another representation, all these um, uh, properties get carried over? Is there a proof for that? It should be because uh, when you uh, calculate the expectation value of an operator, which is a physical observable, uh, then it should not depend upon which representation or what is your basis function or what is the density matrix and so on and so forth. So, this should be independent of that and you should get the same result. In fact, this is what we are trying to show here uh, that uh, calculate the density matrix uh, when uh, it is sigma z is diagonal, uh, which is a familiar case uh, and also uh, uh, calculate it uh, in a situation where, where sigma x is diagonal, which it is not. Okay. So, we will uh, do this problem to show that uh, first how to uh, calculate density matrix and second uh, you know how these uh, density matrices would give rise to same uh, physical quantity which we uh, calculate as the magnetization uh, here to show that that is independent of the basis that we choose. So, whether we choose a basis in which sigma z is diagonal or sigma x is diagonal or sigma y is diagonal. Okay. So, any of these basis sigma y is of course, a complex matrix that you cannot um, change. So, it is 0 1 1 0 just to uh, let you know because we are not doing a quantum mechanics course here and uh, we uh, write down this all these Pauli matrices uh, this is 1 0 0 minus 1. So, in the usual basis uh, sigma z is diagonal and in the basis sigma z is diagonal sigma x and sigma y are, um, are non diagonals rather they have off diagonal prop the elements only off diagonal. And uh, this is an important property if one is diagonal the other two have to be off diagonal for all the uh, basic relationships fundamental relationships of the uh, density matrix or, or of the Pauli matrix to follow which means that uh, they have to be you know anti commuting with some things and they have to be commuting with some uh, other uh, uh, sort of values or um, and and their square has to be equal to 1 and so on and so forth. Okay. We do not go into the details of the properties of Pauli matrices, but then you can look at any quantum mechanics book in order to uh, satisfy yourself. Uh, in fact, it is good that you uh, should look at uh, these uh, properties of this uh, Pauli matrices which I simply leave here. So, read properties of the Pauli matrices.
So, I hope the basic idea is clear that uh, we are going to calculate the, the density matrix for each of these cases 1 and 2 and also uh, go one step ahead and show that some physical observable which is say the uh, expectation value of the sigma z matrix which is nothing but magnetization uh, is independent of which representation you take, which basis states you take. So, the solution and the solution is simple, uh, we have the density matrix equal to exponential minus beta h uh, divided by sum over uh, exponential or rather trace over uh, this uh, is exponential minus beta h. h is already given in this uh, thing, let us call it as equation 1, do not make a, um, uh, try to make a distinction rather between this h on the left side of the equation which is the Hamiltonian and this h on the right side which is written without any uh, curly uh, you know uh, font uh, that is the magnetic field. Okay? So, uh, and just without any uh, loss of generality you take h to be in the z direction. So, the magnetic field to be in the z direction. Okay. So, if you do that uh, the Hamiltonian simply becomes equal to mu b sigma z h. Okay. So, this is the Hamiltonian that we want to consider here and uh, this is nothing but uh, because sigma z can take value plus 1 and minus 1. So, uh, when you take a trace of that you have to take a trace over all these two values which are sigma z equal to plus 1 and sigma z equal to minus 1 and we can write down this stress as exponential beta uh, mu b uh, h plus an exponential minus beta mu b h. I hope this is clear, this is the trace and then of course, we will write down the matrix which is nothing but uh, again the sigma z is um, written, uh, this you have to work it out that uh, really when you take the uh, exponential uh, then uh, of the Pauli matrices is actually occurs in the uh, like what uh, they would look like in the sigma z representation. So, this is like the exponential minus beta mu b uh, h and the way you can prove it is simple uh, is that you ha have to uh, expand this thing uh, in this form okay? um, and then use the uh, properties of the Pauli matrices which tells you that uh, uh, the even powers of sigma is equal to 1, but the odd powers of sigma is equal to sigma. So, uh, when you expand this it will have a powers of h which means powers of sigma and uh, powers of sigma would come as sigma, sigma square, sigma to the power 0, sigma square because you start from p equal to 0. So, sigma 0, sigma, sigma square, sigma cube. So, each of this sigma will uh, be uh, there and uh, sigma square will be equal to 1 and sigma cube is equal to sigma and so on. So, all the even powers would uh, give you 1 and all the odd powers will uh, give you sigma. Okay? So, this is how you can uh, derive this um, uh, form that we have just written here. So, okay. so, this is the density matrix for this given problem and uh, if you now want to calculate the expectation value of sigma z. So, this is equal to nothing but trace of rho, uh, I mean this operator rather, uh, this operator sigma z which is trace of rho sigma z and uh, uh, it is easy to see that the trace of rho is equal to 1 and um, this uh, sigma z then this is equal to uh, exponential beta mu b h. Uh, minus exponential minus beta mu b h and divided by exponential beta mu b h uh, plus exponential minus beta mu b h uh, and this is nothing but equal to tan hyperbolic uh, beta mu b h and a result that you have seen earlier we might have written it with a mu 0. This is that uh, magnetization for this spin half uh, objects. Uh, non-interacting spin half objects kept in a magnetic field and we have shown that uh, this really looks like the tan hyperbolic function which uh, has a value 
is equal to plus uh, mu b h beta mu b uh, uh, h and minus uh, beta mu b h. Uh, so, plus and minus. So, this beta mu b h and minus beta mu b h and this is the tan hyperbolic of that the y axis. and this is that. So, this is where the beta mu b h and uh, beta mu b h. All right. So, this is the uh, magnetization which we are aware of. We have seen it from uh, micro canonical ensemble for a spin half particles uh, which are uh, placed in a magnetic field and we are uh, we have seen it from the canonical distribution as well. But let me now do it uh, from the other representation and uh, this is a slightly tricky, but uh, you can do it by inspection. Uh, so, you have to do it in which the sigma x is diagonal. So, just to uh, remind you that this is where sigma z is diagonal. Okay. Uh, so, and here sigma x is diagonal, but sigma x by itself is not diagonal. You have to change the basis uh, for uh, making it diagonal and um, uh, because your sigma x has a form like this, which is 0, 1, 1, 0 as written in the lower half of this uh, slide and uh, you can diagonalize it by a matrix, which looks like it is like 1 by root 2. Uh, 1 minus 1 1 1 uh, this is purely from speculation uh, or rather uh, inspection of that. So, uh, if you do a p t uh, sigma x uh, p this uh, is like a half because 1 by root 2 uh, will become equal to half and then you have a 1 minus 1 uh, sorry uh, the we are taking a transpose. So, this becomes 1 and 1 and then you have a 0 1 1 0 uh, 1 minus 1 1 1. Uh, so, this is your p t that is transpose and this is the p which we have taken uh, and uh, we, if you multiply this, this becomes exactly same as what we have for the uh, sigma z which is 1 0 0 minus 1. So, uh, this sigma x becomes uh, diagonal now and of course, you can again test then what happens to sigma z and uh, sigma z will become off diagonal it will take the same form as um, sigma x. Okay. So, what is the density matrix? The density matrix is equal to rho uh, this is equal to 1 over 2 and exponential beta mu b h plus exponential minus beta mu b h. Uh, this is equal to 1 uh, 1 1 uh, minus 1 1 and then exponential beta mu b uh, h uh, 0 0 exponential minus beta mu b h. Let me just make sure that written all those things correctly yes. Uh, so, this and then a 1 minus 1 uh, it closer uh, 1 1 and so on and if you uh, multiply the matrices you have to uh, know that uh, you know the matrix multiplication is not commutative. So, you cannot do uh, the any way that you, any order of uh, uh, of multiplication you have to follow a certain order you have to you know uh, first do it from the uh, right and so on. So, uh, this tells you that density matrix has a form which is equal to half uh, and uh, 1. Uh, so, this is the matrix. So, 1 uh, minus tan hyperbolic um, beta mu b h um, tan hyperbolic um, uh, beta mu b h and this is equal to 1 again. So, this form is very different than the form that you have gotten here. Uh, 
this cosine hyperbolic uh, there in the denominator and you have exponential terms in the uh, inside the matrices. Here we have tan hyperbolic terms in the uh, in the inside the matrices and we have all the elements uh, including the diagonal and the off diagonal ones. So, the density matrix can be different in uh, different representations because it depends on the basis that you choose, but that would not deter uh, the uh, expectation values of operators which are physical observables to change values because they should be independent of the basis chosen. And similarly, if we uh, start doing sigma z, remember we should still calculate the expectation value of sigma z because that is what the magnetization is defined. So, the magnetization is the expectation value of the z component of the spin angular momentum which in this case is sigma z. So, this is equal to like a trace of uh, half uh, 1 minus tan hyperbolic uh, beta mu b h and a minus tan hyperbolic uh, beta mu b h uh, and 1 and uh, this is a 0 uh, 1 uh, 0 minus 1 minus 1 0 and so on. Um, that is the form of sigma z in a representation, it is not exactly sigma x, it is minus of sigma x um, in the representation in which sigma x is diagonal. We have not shown this, but uh, you uh, convince yourself that this is true, yourself that this is sigma z in a basis. Uh, where sigma x is diagonal. And if you calculate it, it still comes as 10 hyperbolic uh, beta mu b h. Okay. And uh, so, this is the result that we got earlier uh, in some different context uh, solving this uh, using micro canonical and canonical ensemble and then we get the same result here as well. Okay. So, that uh, tells you that these uh, really in calculating the, uh, the quantum statistical average of operators, uh, this uh, density matrix is quite helpful and uh, finding out density matrix is not difficult. It only uh, uh, sort of demands or requires that you know the Hamiltonian of the system okay. and uh, that is how you calculate this. We have of course, done it for a very simple case where they are spin half particles. So, it is just like a 2 by 2 matrix in more complicated situation it could be a larger dimensional matrix could be an infinite dimensional matrix as well. Okay. All right. So, uh, now I will uh, discuss something very important which is called as the uh, indistinguishability of particles or identical particles. This is very important and uh, one needs to understand it well. So, identical particles and uh, indistinguishability. Okay. All right. So, this is a very important thing as I said. So, what I want to tell you right at the outset a priori is that the definition of identical particles is uh, really same in classical and quantum physics, but uh, they have differing implications. Okay. Uh, it is quite a uh, sort of uh, powerful and tricky statement. Let me try to explain that, that what kind of different implications could it have for identical particles. And it is not difficult to imagine that if you have a system of electrons or a system of uh, you know photons or a system of uh, uh, phonons or any other uh, you know uh, quantum object quantum particles leptons and so on baryons th they are intrinsically indistinguishable you cannot say one from the other okay so uh, if they are uh, then uh, what uh, classical mechanics did so far in terms of distinguishability and uh, one particle description is fine because you know that you're just talking about one particle and nothing else in the universe 
uh, but when you have many particles, uh, at least two particles, how would you distinguish one from another? And uh, uh, as I just said that uh, the definition has to be same in both classical and quantum physics, but uh, they uh, vary or they differ by their implications. Uh, let us see how it does. Let me draw a billiard board. Okay. And uh, this billiard board has uh, say uh, these balls, uh, let us say that these are two balls and even if I know very well that they are identical because we are talking about identical particles, say they are identical, I still have to write for our discussion to proceed as B1 and B2. So, ball 1 and ball 2 are the two uh, sort of balls are the two corners of a billiard board and let us see that this is at a time t equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, what will happen is that the billiard ball would be hit and will reach somewhere on the other extremity at uh, after a time t and uh, let me show these uh, things by two different colors. Uh, so, let me show it by this blue color that this actually goes like B1 goes to this end and B2 goes to this end and they are now at t equal to t we are uh, these two balls that are that uh, went to this part. So, uh, but there is also another possibility that you see that they can actually go like this and they can go like this. Okay. So, uh, say for example, an observer P1 he claims that uh, the blue line is correct okay? and uh, he uh, sort of he takes the initial data. So, his initial data was uh, uh, that uh, uh, the B1 and B2 are at these uh, corners, the lower corners at t equal to 0 uh, and then he uh, uh, takes a data at after time t. he predicts that uh, B1, uh, let me write it as uh, these uh, edges as 1, 2, uh, 3 and 4. Okay. So, he predicts that um, after time t, uh, B1 uh, goes to say for example, uh, so he says that let us B1 goes to 4. So, that is along the red trajectory and B2 goes to 3. So, this is the red trajectory. Another observer P2, he also takes data and uh, after you know some player has come and hit the ball uh, to. Uh, so, he predicts that this goes to 3 and um, B2 goes to 4 okay. and this is the blue trajectory, a blue path. Of course, both can be correct we know that because forcefully we have named them but they are identical. So, they cannot have any name associated with them. So, an independent observer actually would find that both are correct. So, uh, a third independent observer claims both to be correct and he is unable to you know uh, resolve this conflict that uh, what uh, P1 claims or what P2 claims uh, which one is correct and he is he is actually uh, very correct by saying that because these are indistinguishable particles and both both seem to be correct. 
So, uh, what allows us to distinguish uh, one situation from another that is the situation in which, which uh, P1 reports and the situation which P2 reports. Okay? The distinction lies of course on trajectories that is whether it is a blue trajectory or uh, red trajectory okay? which means that it depends on history that is which path you can either call it history or uh, trajectory they mean the same thing in the sense that how they went from one identical particle went from uh, you know from uh, this uh, corner of this uh, thing uh, from from this 1 2 position to the 3 4 position and so on. So, this history is known in classical mechanics, but not in um, not in quantum mechanics. There is no definition of the path fo follows uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, no such history is known. quantum mechanics. Okay. This is a very important uh, statement and a very powerful statement as well that we are unable to know which path do they follow. And if you have any question that how does classical mechanics know do we really solve uh, Newton's laws and uh, uh, know this exact path. Probably uh, in a simulation if you uh, do it uh, you know if you uh, sort of discretize this. Uh, the forces, if you know the forces acting and then numerically solved, you probably can generate the path, but uh, any other path is also possible and that answer is very nicely given by the, uh, by your Lagrange's formalism. Okay? So, uh, we know that uh, the path that it follows actually for a, in that along that path, the action has to be minimum or uh, the LDT has to be you know. Uh, has to be minimum or extremum along that path. So, even if uh, this uh, the Newton's laws do not really specify this there are many ways of going from one to another that is initial uh, x i t i to x f t f uh, i and f they stand for initial and final, but uh, the Lagrange's uh, equation of motion um, that inherently uh, and implicitly assumes that these equations of motion uh, which are identical to that the uh, Newton's laws, uh, they actually take into account the correct path that is followed and the path that actually the particle takes uh, is where the Lagrangian density this L is the Lagrangian density and then uh, dt and so integral of that is minimized which means delta of that is equal to 0 and this is called as an action. So, delta of x equal to 0. Okay. We will not go into details of that, but then uh, there is nothing like this in quantum physics. Quantum physics does not really care or it is possible to construct a path through which the particle goes. We only know about the uh, probability density for a particle to be found at a space time point, nothing more than that. There is no trajectory that could be generated in quantum physics and this is the inherent difference between classical and quantum physics uh, where the distinguishability and the indistinguishability become so important and the statistics become important. And as you have seen that the Gibbs paradox tries to take into account in a sort of hand waving manner by dividing either the, uh, the canonical partition function or the entropy by some factor of n or n factorial and then do some uh, get some results for the Gibbs paradox that is uh, if you allow two identical gases to mix there should be no change in entropy before mixing and after mixing. So, the entropy of mixing is equal to 0 and no such um, things are required for, uh, for quantum mechanics and that is the power of quantum mechanics. Okay? So, we let us just uh, look at a little about the symmetric and anti-symmetric wave function. 
that uh, these uh, under the exchange uh, that happens to the wave function. So, if you have a particle A and a particle B and if you take A to B and B to A, uh, then uh, classical mechanics demands that it is actually a, a new state, a distinct state that needs to be taken into account or there is a distinct uh, configuration that uh, has to be you know incorporated. Quantum mechanics says no, they are the same state, they can at the most vary by uh, sign that is uh, a phase factor. And uh, let us just uh, try to you know uh, sort of put it with some symbols and so on. So, we have uh, say a wave function uh, consisting of two particles and we simply able to write it, we are able to write it with just a ket uh, say A and B and uh, the particles if they are uh, by interchanging them this becomes B A and it becomes a distinct state as far as uh, classical mechanics. So, these are classical uh, mechanics even though uh, you do not see a wave function, but we are simply talking about a, a say a, a, a in the p q space or in the phase space we this is just a, a configuration that we are talking about. So, this is classical mechanics would yield that uh, psi and psi prime are distinct. Okay. But in quantum mechanics, uh, this is not distinct. In fact, this is equal to psi equal to uh, a b uh, equal to some alpha psi prime uh, and this uh, is equal to some uh, B A. And you know that in quantum mechanics, if you multiply a state or a ket by uh, a number or by a, a factor, constant factor, then the state does not change because uh, for getting a new state, uh, that state has to be orthogonal with respect to the uh, earlier state and uh, this uh, they have to be linearly independent uh, and clearly this is not linearly independent it is just uh, there is a phase factor that uh, you know multiplies this uh, one state to another. So, uh, this are not uh, uh, so uh, psi and psi prime are not distinct states and related to each other. Okay, so, that seems fine. So, from here on uh, we have written it as alpha uh, which means that alpha is some number that we have not committed ourselves and here we go and uh, can define there are two kinds of combinations. One is called as a symmetric combination of states which tells you that this psi has to be like 1 by root 2 and uh, a b and a plus b a. Why is this a symmetric? Because if you change a to b, um, it does not pick up a, a sign, it, it just you know the second term becomes first term and the first term becomes second term, it just does not matter which one you write first inside the bracket. So, this is like a symmetric combination. And an anti-symmetric combination is uh, also there and it tells you that this. So, let us write it as symmetric here and anti-symmetric here and it is just it just comes with a, a negative uh, sign. Okay. Now, you see that it is anti-symmetric because if you change a and b there is a, a sign there is a uh, mutual sign negative sign that comes in. Okay. Okay. Let us you know uh, try to make it a little more physical or something that you know uh, instead of A and B. Uh, let us give an example that uh, we are talking about uh, particles uh, inside a uh, 
one dimensional potential box which means there are infinite walls there and the particle is really trapped within that. And uh, let us think that the two particles are uh, trapped in n equal to 3 state and n equal to 4 states. So, two particles uh, trapped in 1D potential box. Okay, from 0 to L. Okay, so, uh, and we want to write down the symmetric and the antisymmetric combination. And let us write down the symmetric combination easily, which we know is 1 by root 2. And uh, we still continue that notation in terms of this. Uh, so, instead of, you know, A and B, we now write it in terms of these uh, uh, N1 and N2 and so on but they mean the same thing because we use the basis that is most convenient to us. And if you remember the basis for a particle in a box is that this E n is really uh, quantified by this n square pi square h cross square by 2 m l square uh, and the psi n is uh, if it is a 0 to l box then it is root over 2 by l uh, sin n pi uh, x by l. Okay? So, um, of course, if it is a symmetric uh, box that is between minus L by 2 to plus L by 2, uh, there are, uh, you know, the, uh, there are parity symmetric solutions would come where uh, N uh, will only be equal to even for this solution and for N odd you will have to have a cosine solution. So, this is uh, fine. So, we will write this as uh, in the N1, N2 basis. So, we will write it as 3, 4 uh, and a 4, 3 each one of them uh, is like, uh, so each n, um, uh, n1, n2, it is uh, like uh, your root over 2 by L square um, and it is a direct product of these uh, things. So, it is like sin uh, 3 pi x over L, sin 4 pi x over L and so on and so forth. Okay, so, that is the the product state and uh, we have taken a square of that and so on. So, uh, this is a meaning. So, there is a symmetric combination and if you want the anti-symmetric combination, uh, well, uh, we have written this S to be uh, outside. So, let me have this S to be inside for the symmetric and A for inside the ket notation. So, psi A is equal to again uh, 1 by root to, uh, you can write it in this notation or you can write it in this notation as well. Uh, that is, uh, you have a, a psi 3. Uh, okay, let me write just 1, uh, then that will be uh, clearer. So, any n state is like root over uh, 2 and it is a n pi x by L. Okay, That is the thing. Uh, let us not write a product state because this is what we want to show that psi 3 x 1 psi uh, 4 x 2 minus of psi uh, 4 x 1 into psi 3 x 2 and so on. So, this is the anti-symmetric combination. So, we can write this as well as the symmetric combination. It is a psi 3 x 1 psi 4 x 2. Uh, plus psi 4 x 1, well let me just squeeze it in here, psi 4 x 1 multiplied by psi 3 x 2. Okay. So, uh, this is a symmetric and the anti-symmetric and uh, very uh, nicely this anti-symmetric part can be written as a um, as a matrix or as a determinant rather, uh, this is called as the Slater determinant and the psi 4 x 1 and the psi 3 x 2 and there is a psi 4 x 2 and so on. Okay? So, this is called as the Slater determinant. So, the anti-symmetric wave function uh, can be written uh, as a determinant. So, if you take the determinant of that, you will get the step that is uh, you see above. Okay? All right. So, um, for uh, you know a larger number of particles, it is a little complicated, but uh, nevertheless it is still doable say for uh, 3 particles. Uh, it is instructive for you to learn uh, 
So, for symmetric we can write it easily because it is a 1 by 3 factorial and uh, we will just use this the fog basis as it is called the number basis. So, it is uh, or rather we just simply use this um, uh, the same context that we have uh, done. So, it is n 1 n 2 n 3 plus n 1 n 3 n 2 uh, plus uh, n 2 n 3 n 1 all the permutations that are possible uh, n 2 n 1 n 3 um, and uh, n um, so n 3 uh, n 2 n 1 and uh, uh, n 3 uh, n 3 n 1 uh, n 2 and so on. Okay. So, these are all the uh, permutation of uh, the pairwise uh, you know particles like this one is just the same order and then we have uh, kept n 1 the first particle to be in n 1 and then n 3 and n 2 are swapped and so on and so forth. So, one is able to make the 6 combination and the normalization demands that there is a 1 by n factorial and uh, this one for the anti-symmetric uh, you just need to understand that uh, for these pairwise uh, exchanges uh, for one pairwise exchange you should pick up a negative sign just like this negative sign that you have it here that uh, let me show it with the color. So, this is the, uh, the negative sign that we are talking about this is here. So, the pairwise exchanges will have a negative sign, but two pairs of such exchanges will bring back another negative sign which means that it should come with a positive sign. And uh, so, this positive and negative uh, all these things can be written a little carefully and if you write them down it is like n 1 n 2 n 3 um, minus n 1 n 3 n 2 because that there is one exchange and then there is uh, the two exchanges which is n 2 n 3 n 1. Uh, so, it is a negative sign and then it is a n 2 n 1 n 3 that has odd exchanges and plus uh, again even exchanges n 3 n 1 n 2 minus n 3 uh, n 1 uh, n 2 and so on okay? um, n 3 uh, n 2 n 1. Okay, so, uh, this uh, will give rise to uh, a sort of uh, you know um, this Slater determinant which gives you uh, say for example, x 1 uh, n 2 x 2 and n 3 x 3 and so on uh, n 1 x 2 um, this is sorry this is n uh, so this x 1 x 1 x 2 psi n 2 x 2 and psi n 3 x 2 okay. and this is psi n 1 x 3 psi n 2 x 3 and psi n 3 x 3. Okay. Now, it is written correctly and it is the, uh, the Slater determinant. So, we should simply uh, draw a vertical line there. So, this for 3 particles you can exchange it to uh, you know larger number of particles. Again this 2 particle let me take a, a mod square of that. So, we want to calculate the probability for the symmetric uh, and anti-symmetric uh, cases. Okay. Uh, so, S and A both if you write it for these 2 particles which are uh, could be at the locations this. So, we have a S. So, again go back to the 2 particle because 3 particle is too complicated to write this uh, modulus because you have to take many terms. Um, so, S A uh, x 1 uh, and x 2 mod square and this is nothing but equal to uh, half of uh, this and then you have uh, a mod square of psi 3 x 1. We go back to our original um, problem of you know n, uh, n 3 and n 4. Uh, so, that and then we have this uh, uh, psi 4 x 1 uh, psi 3 um, x 2 and so on uh, this and the mod square. Now, uh, the plus sign is for the symmetric and uh, negative sign is for the anti-symmetric. And if you open the bracket 
uh, this is uh, really you know uh, psi 3 x 1 square uh, psi 4 x 2 square uh, and a plus a psi 3 x 2 square and psi 4 x 1 square and uh, plus minus uh, you have a psi 3 star uh, x 1 psi 4 x 2 psi 4 star x 2 and uh, psi 3 x 1 uh, that is one uh, you know interference kind of term or mixed term and then you have a psi 4 star x 1 psi 3 x 2 psi uh, 3 star x 1 and a psi 4 x 2 ok. So, this is the, uh, the probability density for this uh, each of these states and uh, this is very interesting. The interesting uh, thing is that, that uh, the first two are uh, predicted by this uh, third observer who came and joined uh, the game at that capital T time. So, he only could only see this, but however, a quantum mechanical system in addition to the two terms, uh, they need a crucial uh, uh, interference term. And in fact, if you remember Young's double slit experiment, uh, this two terms, the first two terms is not uh, important or rather they are, they are important, but they are not crucial in uh, explaining the interference pattern. The interference purely came from uh, the last two terms. So, the classical observer who joined at uh, small t equal to capital T that is at a later time, he sees that uh, one this uh, p that is uh, the p 1 observer and p 2 observer or the vice versa. Uh, and he, he sort of said that both are correct and he was correct, but then he missed this all these uh, main ingredients of the quantum theory. Okay, so, uh, let me now um, sort of quickly do this um, different ensembles and um, or rather this uh, different distribution and uh, let us uh, take a simple case in which we have uh, two particles and uh, three states and so on. Okay. So, basically introduction to quantum statistics. So, the first one is Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. And uh, what it demands is that uh, it sort of uh, you um, take any particle in any state and uh, there is an overall factor of 1 over n factorial that should come in uh, counting the number of microstates that are possible. So, your, um, your omega would simply become equal to 1 by n factorial and then sum over uh, uh, you know k and then uh, you just uh, sum over these one uh, you know microstates uh, which is between an energy E and E plus d or uh, uh, it is sort of restricted in energy space or uh, in the number of particle space and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is how uh, the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics is uh, reconciled that uh, since we are uh, talking about it in the same bracket as the other two statistics, let us just talk about that there are, um, let us not talk about distinguishable and indistinguishable particles for the, uh, for the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, which of course, we know that this is, it is valid for uh, distinguishable particles, but if you are talking about it in the same bracket as Fermi Dirac and Bose Einstein, let us just say that uh, you treat them as uh, uh, distinguishable, yet uh, you uh, divide it by this n factorial number in counting the number of microstates, just like what we have shown here, and uh, there is a crucial n factorial uh, term required, which is called as a Gibbs correction. Okay. Uh, and it is only uh, true in the limiting sense of the other two statistics which we are more interested in. 
So, we will write down this uh, the, uh, the Bose Einstein uh, as we will tell you about the uh, uh, you know some uh, as historical thing about Bose Einstein statistics and so on. Uh, so, this Bose Einstein statistics it tells you that any number of particles can occupy a given quantum state okay, or given energy state and there is no need for this uh, n factorial. So, this is an important thing there is no correction that is needed um, okay. and uh, of course, here uh, in the Maxwell Boltzmann we can simply go ahead and calculate the partition function which would uh, give rise to this exponential minus beta e k and we have seen this how uh, this gives rise to or rather uh, uh, avoids giving uh, uh, the wrong results uh, by the mixing of uh, this uh, gases two identical gases uh, and this is called as a Sacco tetrod equation which we have seen. Now, this Bose Einstein any number of particles can uh, occupy any uh, energy level there is no uh, need to have this thing and uh, similarly in the Fermi Dirac case as well um, we do not have any statistics. Again no uh, n factorial needed here any number of particles can occupy any state. Here only uh, uh, no two particles can occupy a given state. Okay. So, uh, bosons uh, are uh, they love the presence of other bosons whereas, these are completely they repel uh, any other fermions that, uh, that come into their vicinity and so on. And uh, this uh, gives you the main uh, difference between the three statistics um, and we will see examples of that. Uh, we would uh, you know uh, in a simple uh, situation we will start with some uh, few particles in uh, which can be distributed in few energy states and do these um, calculate this distribution and calculate the partition function maybe the canonical partition function for those and show that uh, what are the differences between these three statistics in very simple situations. And then we shall go ahead and uh, talk about many particles and uh, introduce these statistics in from a more formal perspective. Uh, and uh, finally, we would go ahead and uh, 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 do exercise uh, on each of those uh, or rather applications of each of those statistics in various physical situations. For example, the Bose-Einstein statistics would uh, give us the right uh, uh, specific heat expression for uh, phonons say for example or it would give rise to the radiation pressure due to a black body or uh, due to electromagnetic radiation uh, the pressure due to that uh, or you have uh, these uh, fermions we will uh, talk about metals which are free electrons and uh, we can talk about the Pauli paramagnetism or we can talk about uh, these white dwarf stars uh, which are taken as or which can be considered as a very uh, uh, extremely degenerate uh, Fermi uh, gas and uh, we will do this uh, calculations uh, or rather these example problems or these applications on these various statistics. So, I hope uh, the idea has been made clear in this week that uh, we are really uh, getting into quantum statistics. There are uh, various um, uh, corrections or fixations that uh, uh, need to be done uh, for one to actually transit from the classical statistics uh, to uh, quantum statistics. So, we will carry on with quantum statistics from uh, next week onwards. Thank you. Mm -hmm.